Now uh, we come to the part in the day where we're going to talk about the commitment to growth. And uh, for that, I'm bringing on Tom Schwab. Uh, Tom is an amazing individual that I met back in 2016. He is the chief evangelist officer. Is that correct? Uh, I, did I get your title right? You've got the title right. And Excellent. I just chief evangelist officer, interview valet. And we've known each other for a multitude of years. Uh, you run a, a company that I am... Uh, I absolutely love Interview Valet. Uh, you and your company bring me a bunch of amazing guests for Shareable, and you've always been uh, really amazing to bounce ideas off of, and uh, and your leadership out in the world is, is evident. Uh, primarily, I want to bring up the fact that I put a call out on LinkedIn and said, okay, people in my network, who's a leader I should be talking to about growth? And the very first person I got back was someone from your team that said, oh, you should be talking to Tom about growth, his commitment. To, and, and I knew you from your work as, you know, an advocate for podcasting, but I'm learning now about your, uh, your advocacy for growth of the people on your team. It's something I was very proud uh, that one of our team, my team members mentioned me. And then I was honored when you, you reached out uh, to me on that. And because to me, that's, that's the legacy. Um, nobody's going to remember the, you know, the sales, other things like that. But if you grow leaders in your company, the impact that can have is just amazing because, uh, you know, it's one thing for the, the CEO, whatever that means, right. For me as chief evangelist officer, you know, but for people to say, oh, that's, you know, they're impressive. But what really touches me is when I, I go to a meeting and, and meet somebody like you and, uh, you know, they say, oh, you, you need to know Joanne, Joanne's great uh, and does all these things. And when they start talking about the people on your team, to me, it's like, being a proud parent. Um, and it's like that, that growth to me, that is what's magic. And that is what's going to, um, survive, you know, not just a quarter, but for years and years. I completely agree with you. And, and I can say in my, uh, short, but illustrious leadership career, the, the points that I can look back on and say that I had a hand in someone's growth are definitely my proudest, uh, of, of all of it. Um, today we're talking about the eight commitments of the team and specifically I had you on because I want to talk about the commitment that a team makes to growth. And in, as with all the rest of the commitments, the leader does have to model a commitment themselves to growth and a commitment to their team's growth and a commitment to these ideals. So I'm curious in, in your experience, how have you found, um, how have you found yourself able to create a commitment to growth on your team that you get people excited about their opportunities to grow because sometimes that can be difficult. Some people just want to clock in, clock out. How have you been able to inspire growth as, as a mindset on your team? I think if I look back on it and my experience, so uh, my first job out of college uh, was running nuclear power plants in the Navy, right? I, 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 my first job was in the Navy and their whole thing was growing people. You, the joke was you just about got comfortable at a job and they'd move you on to the next one, right? Because you've got to do a lot of things to, to go, you know, go from being a, a new ensign to running a ship in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of that was that idea of a mission of what you're doing here, even at a lower level job is important and you need to master this so you can go on to the next one. And that sense of mission is, is so amazing. And I remember seeing that in the military, what people would do because they believed what they were doing was important. And I've done the same thing with, with all of the companies that, um, that I've worked in, that I've led. And even now, right. We're not just, we're just not making bookings. We're not doing introductions, right. You're changing people's lives. And one of the things that, that I tell people is that the greatest gift in the world that you can ever give someone is introducing them to a new person or a new idea, right? It's the one thing that they can't do for themselves and it will change their life, right? And so framing it in that way that what you're doing is important and it's impacting that. And when you find ways that you can celebrate that or um, share that back with them, I, I think that makes people, I don't want to say the word motivated, 
right? Because motivation is something that comes and goes, but it's more like Matt was talking, you know, they're committed. They've got ownership into it. And that's that whole idea of being psychologically self-employed, right? They're doing it because they believe in it, not just because, you know, um, they've got to check off that box. You raise such an amazing point that I honestly don't even think I've considered up until this point. I mean, it might have been lingering in the background for me, but you're talking about inspiring a commitment to growth on the team by way of the mission, of by way of clearly defining and clarifying the purpose and mission of what we're all doing together and how that actually intersects with the ownership that we were just talking about. That if you create the right destination of where we're going together, that big why, you get everybody kind of aligned in that and taking ownership over that direction. You create the conditions where growth is a byproduct, where people commit to it out of their own, you use the term psychological self-employed. I've never heard that. I say psychologically unemployable for myself. <laughs> um, but you create the conditions where that culture of growth on the team actually kind of naturally emerges. I'd never thought of it that way. Well, it, it's uh, that old story about, you know, there's two Masons, right? You ask one of them, what are they doing? And he's like, I'm, I'm laying bricks. And the other one says, I'm building a cathedral. They're both yeah. doing the same thing. Um, I tell you what, I, I'll get up every morning um, to build a cathedral. Uh, I'm going to sleep in if it's just another day of laying bricks. So I think it's, it's trying to make them understand what they're doing is important because what's the flip side of that? If I'm just, if I'm just laying bricks, um, why do I want to get better? Why do I want to grow? Um, it's at that point, it's almost, you feel like a cog in the wheel. Um, I'm laying bricks until they can find a machine to do it better or to replace me. Um, and, um, yeah, I think it's making people understand what their part in the world is and, what their next part in the world is too. That's one of the things that always struck me. Uh, like I said, in the military, there was always a growth opportunities, always that next thing. And maybe that's in, in the company. Maybe that's without outside the company. And I can think of some interns that I had early on. I knew I was going to have them for one semester. I, I knew they weren't going to graduate and come work for me, but I was still proud and say, you need to learn this because you're going to have people that are reporting to you someday. And, you know, I, I look back on those and some of those interns are still friends to this day. And I always joke with them that someday I'm going to hire, or they're going to hire me, right? Uh, because they're so sharp that uh, they'll buy my company or something. Yeah. Oh my God. That's such a good point. Um, I was thinking uh, the, um, the, the, the challenge for a new manager and because so you've had the the benefit of the experience of having that experience in the military you've had several companies that you've worked in and now you have your own company so like you're for lack of a better term you're very seasoned in this when we think about the new manager there's kind of two things that i'd imagine that are immediately smacking them in the face in this conversation around growth so the first is kind of to your point about the interns, why should I invest in growing this person if they're going to leave? So that's the first thing. And the second thing might be, well, how do I even get someone to care about their own growth if they're not inspired to already be here and work at like, if they just want to come in and, and, you know, clock in, clock out, do their bare minimum, how do you advise new managers get started thinking about these two issues? You know, I just had this conversation with one of our new managers and I, I bought all six of them, uh, the new managers copies of your book, because I think what you're doing is so important, right? That foundational work there. And it, her question to me was, well, how do you motivate people? And honestly, you know, you said I'm experienced. Maybe it's just gray hair, right? One of the things I've noticed is that I can't want something more than the people want it. Right. Yep. And motivation to me is like uh, cotton candy. Right. You get the sugar rush and then it goes away. Um, and I, I, I think if you just try motivating them, it's the the burden's always going to be on you as a manager. Right. But how can you empower them? How can you make them see what they're doing is important? How can you make them successful? How can you celebrate their wins and make sure that they're they're okay, let's call them losses or failures, aren't failures, but learning things from there. So, um, you know, it's, I think at times we spend too much time with the C or D players, trying to get them up to the level 
than we do trying to take the A and B players to the next level. And I think now as labor is so short, right? People can, people can choose what team they're going to be on. Right. So I think you need to make sure um, maybe this is more of a senior leader, right? That you have great people on your team, not just warm bodies, because um, if you've got somebody that on a team, especially from a, a junior manager, if, if you're hiring C players for them, it's going to be really, really tough. Right. That that's going to be tough for them as opposed to if you're bringing them all stars um, that can, you know, they can do so much better with that. And going back to the, the military example uh, you mentioned um, uh, extreme ownership by Jocko Williams. Yep. Love that book. Right. Um, but I all often think are the seals, the best examples of leaders, or is it like the bosun's mates? Right. Uh, the 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 people in the Navy that are uh, chip and paint. Right. Because those people that are at, at the SEALs, they're motivated. They are you know, you've got the best of the best there. And to lead them is like leading a, a major league ball team. Right. That's that takes a level. But those people that have to uh, have to lead the the people that aren't doing the glorious jobs that, you know, May, may be there because it's the best job they can, they can get, or, um, you know, uh, at that level, I think that could be even tougher leadership there. Um, yeah. so it makes me think that there should be a book just called ownership because his was extreme ownership. It's like, you just want to have like the day-to-day -day ownership book. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I think it's, um, uh, that idea, if you can, um, if they, if they take the ownership of it, um, and, and the other thing too, um, is if they're, if they're there for the leader, I think that makes a difference. And that's, you know, I love the title of your book, the lovable leader, um, because early on, you know, I would look at that as almost a negative, right? If everybody loves me, then I'm not doing it right. And, uh, not everybody will love you. Uh, but I think there's that, that respect, the love and, um, you know, do you want the love from the higher ups? You know, are you loved by your superiors or are you loved by those people that report to you? And I've seen in my career, what a difference that makes in growth, right? Because there are certain people that you may fear them and you'll do what it takes, you know, uh, but then there's other people that you love and you would, you would, you know, walk through fire um, just to, just to make them happy uh, to hit their goal, whatever it is. I love it. And I agree with you 100%. And in, in those new manager cases where they're trying to build the sort of culture that we've been talking about here today, how do you recommend and, and how have you maybe uh, using your own personal example, how have you gone about connecting with your team to look for those development opportunities, to look for those areas for growth? How do you have those conversations? What are maybe some of the questions you start out with? New managers coming into this, how should they start by th by getting their team primed for growth? I think as a leader, you set the example, right? So the way you manage them, they will manage their people. The mm -hmm. questions you ask them, they will ask their people. Um, and as a new leader, they don't know what they don't know, right? Um, so helping them with a framework um, of, of how they can do that, asking them the questions to help them get to the answers there. And um, I think, you know, um, like I said, we've got new leaders on our team. We just promoted the next level of leaders there and having that open, frank conversations with them. And, you know, we're an entirely remote team. We've got people in Europe and North America. So it's not like I can just sit down and have a beer with them or, you know, go out to lunch, but, we get together through scheduled calls. Um, there's an agenda with it, but it's just a zoom call and those open-ended questions. And, you know, what are you most proud of? What are you struggling with? Where do you need my help help with? What questions do you have? And sometimes, you know, certain people will come with an entire list of things. Other times you have to ask those questions there, but I think it's uh, uh, maybe good managing is like good parenting, like good coaching. Um, it's all about uh, that listening and, and asking the questions. 
I was just going to bring up the coaching aspect. So what it sounds like is you're saying really creating a culture of growth is, is a commitment to being a good coach as a leader, a good mentor, somebody who's committed to the development of their team and showing yourself as someone who's committed to your own growth and learning, being vulnerable and open and saying when you don't know gives them the space to do that. And then when you ask them what they're working on, what they're interested in, what they, you know, what they're excited about, that helps you to build out that sort of, for lack of a better term, that agenda, or that curriculum for where you may be able to help them step into and grow and learn new skills. And whether or not that comes back to help the organization or not, it does help that person grow and deepens the engagement you have with them on the team. Yeah. And I, I think today, you know, in this buyer's market, um, you can work any place, right? Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Everyone that works for us is a volunteer. If they don't like it, they could go out and get another job tomorrow, right? So what are we offering them, right? It's, if it's just a little bit of more pay, well, somebody else is always going to do that. But I think the one thing that you can offer your you know, new people, your entry-level managers, is to help them grow personally. And it's funny that when they start growing personally, um, your team's going to grow, your profits are going to grow, your sales are going to grow. Um, it, it's like the, the, the chicken and the egg, which comes first. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but, uh, um, when, when one thing grows, it seems like it all grows. I love it. Well, I'm going to ask you the final question, uh, that I've been asking all of the guests that have come on for the launch event. Um, for, I just want to first also thank you for coming on and talking about growth, making the time for me for this launch event. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, so thank you, Tom. So the question I've been asking is, I came up with this title, Lovable Leader, it resonated with me. It sounded like a thing that would conjure in everybody's mind a person that they've worked with. So who from your past or present comes to mind when I mention the term lovable leader? When you said that, and I first thought it, I thought of one person more than any other. It was the skipper of the first ship I was ever on. Um, Captain Bill Hayden, his call sign was T-Ball. Now this guy was a guy that not only was a Top Gun pilot, then he ran all of Top Gun, right? And you're like lovable leader. Yes. I mean, this guy was, was the skipper of an aircraft carrier. He was the biggest fan. He was the, the biggest cheerleader. This guy never slept. He always thought the best of us and he could be tough. Right. And if, if, if you got called on the captain's mast because you did something wrong, I think most of the people there, they felt bad because they let the old man down, not because they were going to get, you know, going to get in trouble. Um, and he just had this spirit about him where he, he believed in us. Um, we would do anything for him. And I've been friends with a lot of people on the ship since, and that, you know, from junior officers down to junior enlisted, they all have that same vision of him. And it was really funny because, um, after he left, we had another leader and, you know, same rank, um, I guess he was a great leader, but this guy was an authoritarian. Everybody feared him. You yep. did what you needed to do, but not more than that. And you think about all the different people. Uh, it was uh, Captain Hayden. T-Ball T -ball was the lovable leader. Amazing. Amazing. I love how uh, everyone I've asked about it has somebody that they can look back on that. And, and that leads me to believe that there's lovable leaders out there. We can create more of them. And um, and thank you for picking up the, the book for your uh, for your team. I sincerely appreciate it. I hope that it helps. I'd love any feedback you guys have. Keep doing what you're doing. Know that I'm I'm a big fan of Interview Valet uh, as as a host that you send people to, and hopefully as somebody who's going to be a client of yours uh, in the very near future. So we would uh, love that, Tom. Thanks so much for coming on, and um, you know, best of best of luck on the rest of the year for you. Um, and thanks for coming out and supporting me, man. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for what you do and who you are. Thanks, man. I'll see you soon.